I guess my timer's on, so I'll get going. Um, so how I want to structure this is essentially to prime it for our panel coming in, right? So what I'm going to do is give you a very quick overview of DAO, what it is, what it means, and what are some of the trends uh, that exist in the market. So with that, oops, where am I pointing at? Ah, there you go. Angie, I don't think this is working. <laughs> oh, there you go, okay. Um, so state of DAO, what, how I envision this is essentially to be is, you know, I don't know if you've heard this story about an elephant and blind men and women trying to identify what exactly is the object in front of them is. You know, some say it's a snake. When you touch the tail, it's a rope. Otherwise, it's a tree. But they're not wrong because they're all coming from various different angles. And the story is no different in Tao as well. But there is a way to simplify that for folks who are not too embedded in the space. And how I essentially see this is DAO first off stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And often jokingly, because anyone can create a Discord group and have a community build up, its tools exist, it's often known as the Discord Autonomous Organization, right? Um, but the way to visualize this is think of it like a vending machine. Right? It's a large vending machine that exists on a blockchain. You may ask why. Because just like a vending machine, it only does what it is programmed to do. You put money in, you get coke out. You put money in, you get a chocolate out. Nothing more, nothing less. So what this has enabled is a lot of use cases that come alongside. So a DAO allows anyone with an idea to coordinate pool funds and even create tokens that represent their share within that organization. And this has led to a massive uh, you know, pool of types of DAOs. While every day you have a new category that gets created, I'm just highlighting some of the top eight that come to mind, right? So those are broken down into protocol DAOs. So on your left is some of the examples, and on the right is what you're seeing is what it essentially stands for. So protocol DAO. So those essentially governs decentralized apps. So for example, Uniswap. So Uniswap launched the Uni token for governance, and you can use those governance tokens, Uni, to vote on various decisions within that DAO, right? You can manage treasuries, and so on and so forth. Similarly, on investment DAO, you have Meta Cartel that invests in projects to accelerate the growth of Web3. In fact, even the, your traditional VCs, institutional VCs, have come into this space. So Bessemer DAO, they created something similar to allow for the cross-collaboration and pollination of ideas, projects, creators within this space. Number three is Collectors DAO, which is where members pool funds uh, together to invest treasury funds in blue chip collectibles, arts, so think of Bode Ape Yacht Club, Mutant Ape, Cool Cats, and so on and so forth, where each person owns a share corresponding to their personal investment. So these list goes on and on, and I'm going to cover a few more. Um, so Grant, oh sorry, the social one, which is focused on self-organizing uh, community aspect by connecting like-minded people. So I don't know if you guys have heard of Friends with Benefits, which is also backed by one of the largest uh, venture capital firm, A16Z, and with just 75 friend FWB token, you can get access to all the things, all the creators, all the participants, participants that are in there. And then MediaDAO, which is a unique way of disrupting the way social media and large centralized organizations have been operating. Right? So I'm a big consumer of Decrypt, which is a news platform, but it allows its content creators be benefited and vote on what articles should be published onto the platform and those that should not be. So all in all to say, these types of DAOs will continue to grow and we'll have new 
uh, categories created pretty much on a daily basis. But there's still a lot of issues and trends that gets identified. And I'm going to highlight that in the next six minutes or so. So trend number one that is pretty evident is the concentration problem. Right? So on the left, what you're seeing is some of the top 10 DAOs that are in market today. And what's starkingly and alarmingly clear is less than 1% of all DAO governance tokens holders have 90% of voting power. That's massive. That goes against the essential the baseline ethos of decentralization to begin with. So what implication does that have? That means 1% of those token holders can essentially outvote 99% of the ecosystem on any given decision. And this, as I said, contradicts the tenets of decentralization. So what impacts can it further have? So if you look at DAO from a governance token holder's standpoint, the three main objectives. One, you vote, which is simple. If you hold a token, you can vote. Any holder can do it. Creating a proposal. Typically what you're seeing in the market is a user must hold anywhere from 0.1% to 1% of outstanding token supply in order to create a proposal. Right? I'm not saying that's true across all the DAOs, but most of the major DAOs that you see on the left have this uh, criteria baked in. And then lastly, passing that proposal where a user must hold anywhere between 1% to 4% in order to make a decision that that proposal should be passed. So what are we trading off here? Right, it's two things. There could be too many holders creating a proposal. What does that do? Proposal quality falls. And then that can also create spam issues, right, from a governance standpoint. On the other hand, if too few holders are creating proposal, the decentralized governance narrative that we have been trying to, you know, uh, propose and build these layer one uh, protocols around falls apart. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer yet, but those are some of the issues I definitely wanted to highlight to make sure as we design new utility tokens, and if, in fact, when we are working with our partners designing these governance and utility tokens, we should start thinking about these issues at hand. And, and one example that comes to mind, and this is no way <laughs> this against the Solana ecosystem by any means, uh, Solend, which is essentially a cautionary tale, right? Solend is a DAO governing the Solana-based lending protocol. The story goes, uh, Solana's price was dropping. This was summer of this year. It fell so much further, the protocol's biggest whale, which as we identified in the, big, uh, in the previous slide, uh, could potentially you know, outweigh the 99% of, uh, of the token holders, would face a margin call if the price continued to fall down that could render Solan insolvent. And further, putting $20 million worth of Solana onto the market, which could further uh, tank the asset's price and upend the entire Solana ecosystem. So now, remember the point we talked about, the decentralization narrative. So what happened in this case, a proposal was put up on the, on, on the DAO, which called for a vote to take control of the whale's account. So now you're getting into the centralization category and liquidate its position through OTC desk rather than the open market. Eventually, the, the results was 1.1 million yes votes to 30,000 no votes. So that is complete opposite of where we are trying to drive this entire ecosystem towards. Although this was another proposal was made to kind of <laughs> negate everything that happened through this proposal, so nothing really fell apart. The Solana price did not tank. The, mark, the Solana itself did not completely crash. But this is one of those cautionary tales that we should remember that this can happen when you give too much power to too few of people within an ecosystem, whether it be in real world or on a protocol level. Um, so continuing that narrative itself, right? So the DAO asset concentration. So this is an interesting trend where we're starting to see, you know, a lot of uh, number of DAO categories have started to accum accumulate uh, a large number of uh, assets. And by category division, you're seeing DeFi, uh, venture capital, infrastructure, NFT, or collectibles, DAOs are the ones where there's a lot of assets getting accumulated. That means there's a lot of projects and a lot of community support is behind it. 
On the right, what you're seeing is what are those assets held by these DAOs in itself. So USDC clearly uh, is the leader with DAI and then Ethereum. So we're starting to see there's a clear formation concentration of assets, not only by the DAO category, but also by the cryptocurrencies that are being utilized within the space. And this was a very interesting one, which is the DAO contributors, right? Um, so DAO contributors are essentially folks who vote on proposals, who are responsible for making some of the key decisions on where the future of the DAO itself lays. Um, what's interesting is, uh, contrary to the popular belief, 18% of DAO treasury funds came from self centralized services. These could be uh, centralized exchanges like a Binance or a Coinbase, but 82% originated from decentralized services, which is actually a powerful narrative as the space grows, because that means a lot of people uh, are engaging with DeFi products in order to cast their vote within these decentralized ecosystems. And that, this is what will enable um, you know, the ecosystem to grow, new DAOs be created, and potentially solve the centralization issue that was previously identified. And lastly, this is a map of all the tools and assets and infrastructure that's being created to service these DAOs. As you can see, it's very fragmented, right? You have token service categories, you have governance, you have treasury management, risk management, growth, community operations development. So what, what this is showing you clearly is not only there's fragmentation, they're all solving for a very specific use case within the categories of DAOs that's being created. There will come a time that it will be hard to know which product, tool, or service to use. So while this allows us to open up a lot more opportunities, I think now is the time to build and start thinking about how to stack these up so that if a DAO comes tomorrow and they want to you know, use some of these product or launch a token and have the governance mechanism baked in and have the community baked in, what are kind of the tool sets we should be targeting? And some are better than, than the others, right? It's the same way not all, all DAOs are created equal, not all tools are created equal. Um, like, not everyone is Horizon Labs when it comes to token design. So, um, so those were kind of the takeaways, and my time's up as well. Uh, and if you guys want to connect, just reach out. That's my LinkedIn QR. <laughs> <laughs> code basically well, <laughs> and Angie's here to push me off the stage no no no. I, no just the contrary I need you to stay here just for a few more minutes okay. All right. I <laughs> um, I'd stage. like to take a few questions from the audience just because we need to oh perfect Sean right. please uh, I'll give you um, wait hold on perfect perfect yeah we, we can take a couple of qu quick questions All right thank you hi um, Thanks so much, it's really interesting. I gotta be honest, I did not understand the contributor slide at all. Like, not at all. Which one? The contributor slide. Oh, yes. What, what was going on there? This, this one? one, yeah. Well, so really basic, like I'm a five-year-old. Yeah, 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 so, you know, typically what you'll see, their tokens or the governance tokens sit across various centralized platforms uh, like Binance, right? or like a Coinbase. Uh, and they're large veils, which are either using centralized exchanges, for example, or their, their asset sits on some sort of a DeFi platform. What, what, what we're seeing is, when it comes to voting, right, on various proposals that sits on um, these DAOs, about 18% of those tokens that are being used to vote on proposals comes from these centralized platforms versus decentralized platforms, which is 82%. That means a lot of users or the holders of that token are utilizing DeFi tools in order to cast their vote and helping kind of uh, bridge, the, uh, bridge the ecosystem and, uh, and continue to uh, you know, uh, provide support through the DeFi tools. Okay, so <clears throat> an example of a DeFi exchange would be like Aave? Yeah, and, yeah. and a centralized exchange would be Coinbase or Binance. Coinbase, uh, yeah, or like a Sushi Swap, Uniswap versus your Aave and Compound. Uh, not sorry, Aave and Compound are decentralized, but Binance and Coinbase, I meant. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for the question. Sorry, I can really not see anyone. The light's too bright. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>
I think we have another question. Yes, right here, <laughs> Vano. Thank you. Uh, Rohan, like, what, what do you think? How can DAOs incentivize people to participate, like, to vote? Because we see, like, in recent years, obviously, that lots of tokens live on centralized exchanges or in like DEX pools, which are un un unable to vote. So, what do you think, like? can DAOs do to incentivize more participation? Yeah, I think the narrative goes back to community as a whole to think about what value add uh, products or tools need to be built that utilizes their token, right? Um, which incentivizes them to liquidate some of their holdings to participate in that ecosystem. Um, so for instance, if you're building a game that requires token, unless there's a, build, a game or a platform that's built that requires me to free up my token, why would any holder want to uh, use their uh, tokens and not keep it parked? Or maybe even there's a staking uh, reward that comes along with it, which is just sits there, accrues interest, or the price of the token itself goes up. So it all really ties down very neatly with the utility, and DAO really needs to think about how they should incentivize, even before they incentivize users to free up their tokens, they should incentivize their users to come up with better proposals so that you know, quality value add projects could be built within that ecosystem. Sorry, I'm going to repeat that. So voting's not governance. It is an element of governance. And we've had, obviously, years to think about this at, right. at Horizon uh, and, and, and also went down the path with the, the Treasury proposal. So like the United States Co Constitution, that's a, a, a form of, of a go governance documents which has different levels of voting and different proposals. And you can't like terminate the entire United States through voting. Um, so do these DAOs, because I, I, I flat out don't know, do they have governance documents, rules about what can be proposed, uh, different levels of voting? Are they full up um, governance organizations? Or are they just kind of a way of saying, well, we're decentralized, so you can't sue the founders uh, or, or, or tickets to court? Yeah, I think the short answer is it's more of the latter in majority cases, right? It's just a way of organizing communities, organizing people to do cool stuff, <laughs> right? And there are a handful of DAOs that are actually thinking it more systematically to allow the user base or the community to think through, okay, what comes next? And that, in, in that structure, you have to provide those guardrails uh, for them, how they should be writing about a proposal. And ApeCoin DAO is a great example, right? The initial AIPs that came out that laid out a structure, what when you, when as a community member, when I'm proposing something for the DAO, this is the structure that you should follow in order for it to be reviewed and so that everyone understands and what are the kind of the qualities that needs to go around. So the maturity within the space is coming. It's slow, but uh, to your point, it's, it's a handful of those projects that, that are implementing this at a very um, skill level. Great, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rohan.